Today on the show, I'm happy to have Dayan Enov. He's the founder of Pentaton. They're a custom software company with optimum delivery. They build custom software on demand. So, Dayan, how long have you had this company now? When was it founded? The company was founded in 2006 in the U.S. Our mothership company was founded in 92 in Europe. And what's the current revenue of the business? Uh, about $40 million last year. And how many employees does the mothership have? 800. 800. How do you even manage 800 staff? Ah, through divide and conquer, like everything else. Uh, we have a number of divisions. Uh, our companies are different because 80% of the original 10 founders are still with the company and they run various pieces of it. It, it also grew organically, even though it is now public in Europe. Uh, but the original team is very much still in play. So the original team from the founding in 92? Correct. How do you keep partnerships going that long? Friendships are hard to come by and we treasure them. <laughs> and I have to tell you that being able to do business on a handshake uh, uh, with people that you've grown to trust pretty much explicitly over 30 years is a revelation. I'm sure it is. And then I know you also are big into investing in companies. So what has the Silicon Valley dance been like for you? Entertaining. Keeps, keeps you young. Something new every day and very well suited to people that have minor attention deficit disorders. So what has been the experience so far with investing in all, investing in all these different startups? I, I think like everybody else, you win some, you lose some, you learn from your mistakes and you move forward and, you know, set your expectations accordingly. It's in the long term, it becomes very much about the journey rather than necessarily always the, the destination, if you would. So what have been some of the specific examples of the ones that have worked, the ones that haven't? I recently started a new startup actually in the medical diagnostic space called Luvantix. And we're actually out raising money for it now, a second round of financing. And our pitch has been to investors is that the team uh, has been together for 20 years. We've done seven different companies together and returned about three and a half billion dollars to investors. And so when you have some successes that you can point to and you really appreciate that people invest in companies because they are looking for returns uh, rather than investing for companies on a hype cycle, even though there's some of those as well, you get more focused and more disciplined of knowing what you're working towards. When picking a company to invest your time in or your money, do you think it's more about the people, the idea, or is it a mix? Oh, it's of course a mix. You have to be excited about the idea. And if you have the luxury to only work with people that you can respect, it's uh, fantastic. With these startups, how do you navigate that fine line between persistence and when it's time to pivot or change course? Again, discipline and timeline, set goals and evaluate on short cycles. Can we accomplish this by this date? And if you cannot, be honest, why not? And do we need to change or do we give it more time? And be, be merciless in killing things off that don't work. And then over time, what would you say has been the most transformative experience in your life that's shaped who you are today? Uh, uh, I would say uh, some years ago, I had uh, one of my board members was an older gentleman who had actually been the CEO of arms manufacturing. I kept semi-retired and was sitting on a board as a senior advisor. And I was young and I was all about technology. This was around the dot-com years. And one day John pulled me aside and said, you're a very smart guy technology, but you have a gap in your education. And I said, what do you mean? I have a gap in my education. I know it all. I, give me a problem. I'll solve it. What are you talking about? I said, the gap in education in your education is that you have never worked as a salesperson and you need to work for a year as a salesperson on commission. That will make you much better in what you do for the rest of your professional life. And I was extremely lucky that circumstantially, literally six months ago, six months after that, I had an opportunity to do exactly that. I actually spent not quite a year, but about nine months sitting at a desk, cold calling people, trying to sell technology that I was closely involved in originally building. And that was probably the best postgraduate education I could have gotten in, in, in my professional career. It uh, dramatically changed my attitude 
in my perspective on doing business. And uh, it was just, I was very lucky to have that experience. You know, on the path of choosing board members, what role has mentorship played in your journey? Oh, incredible. Um, people bring so much experience and wisdom and sort of war wounds, if you would, to the table that if you are open-minded and you always acknowledge that you don't know what you don't know and you're willing to learn, it's a must-have. Mentors and colleagues are the best way to learn and to really appreciate the opportunities that you're given. Definitely. Let's talk a little bit about this new venture in the healthcare space. What are you trying to tackle with this one? It's exciting because it's something that we've been doodling on for 10 years. And about a year and a half, two years now, the timing was right. We were just closing off another big project and uh, the team was looking for the next thing to do. And we decided to resurrect it. And circumstantially, at the same time, the whole AI hype cycle began. And it just so happens that this technology actually is AI related, even though not in the same way that chatbots and large language models are, but it's more of a machine learning technology. But what we're trying to do is to build a platform to develop medical tests in what we call a mechanistic manner, meaning that the technology is a factory that can chunk out medical tests for various diseases. And the other exciting part is that we're using uh, urine samples, which are very easy to collect compared to blood or tissue or biopsies. And what attracted me is that obviously I'm a software guy by inclination and, and experience, and I understand part of the technology. And what we're doing is taking a urine sample and running it through uh, gas chromatography. And chromatography is a very old discipline, probably been around for seven years. Essentially, very well understood. It turns the urine sample into data that tells you what's in it. And now taking that data, you can now train a model for a disease. And then that model, when presented with an unknown sample, can tell you, hey, this sample matches 92% of uh, uh, people with similar samples that have diabetes or bladder cancer or heart disease, and only 2% two, only two of people that don't. And so by using the same sort of machine learning approach uh, in building these classifiers, we believe that we can build uh, multiple models for multiple diseases. And the, the result is that you can literally pee in the cup once and then run the wet laboratory work, which is a chromatography once, and then run the data through as many models as you have and get uh, an indication whether you should seek medical attention for something uh, that you're getting an indication for in a dozen or maybe 50 different types of conditions. And so that is very exciting because it has implications in terms of cost, accessibility, convenience. It checks a lot of boxes from, from uh, the go-to-market checklist, if you would. And the technology is exciting. So if somebody share your excitement in urine sample technology, how could they get in touch? Dot com. Uh, that's L-U-V-E-N-T-I-X, Luventis. And there's a very uh, cute four-minute video on the homepage that pretty much tells you everything that we're doing. And it, even the video has AI-generated avatars that we're very, I, I'm very proud of. I thought if you're about AI, we should use AI everywhere. Everybody make sure to check that out. Thank you, Dayon, for coming on the show. And everybody listening to another episode of Failing to Success. If you like the show, make sure to subscribe. I'm your host, Chad Kalecki, and we'll see you next time.